and opinions expressed by guests on this podcast do not represent or reflect the official policy or position of the Take a Paycheck Foundation and podcast. All information shared is from personal experiences and does not constitute medical advice. We do not take responsibility for any statements expressed during the podcast. Take a Paycheck does not endorse any products or services. Any said products or services mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you or your condition. Please consult with your physician if you have medical questions, as it may pertain to your condition. Welcome back to this week's episode on Take a Pain Check. I'm so excited to be talking to Jacqueline and Alexa today. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Alexa. Can you both give me a brief introduction about yourself? Tell me a little bit about your education, your career, your hobbies, and your future plans. Hi, I'm Alexa. I I'm an attorney for legal aid. I do primarily debt collection and medical debt defense. I have been a public interest attorney for almost eight years now. I live in Denver, Colorado with my sister Jacqueline, and I like to hike and ski, um, watch TV, bake, cook, (laughs) all the normal things. And I'm Jacqueline. Um, I'm 28 and I graduated from Colorado College in 2016. And then I went on and got my master's in family and human development. I was diagnosed with a bunch of rheumatic diseases and other chronic illnesses when I was 14. And that led me to create Datability, um, which is a dating app for the disabled and chronically ill communities. And some other things, fun facts about me. Um, I'm a huge Swifty. I love Taylor Swift with all my heart. Um, I love volunteering at the animal shelter and playing with my dog and hanging out with friends and family. So you're both really, really busy from what it sounds like. Jacqueline, what are some of the rheumatic diseases that you are diagnosed with? So the first one was that I was diagnosed with is Ehlers-Danlos, and I was diagnosed at 15. And then once I graduated college, my health really took a downhill turn and I was diagnosed with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And so what actually led you to see a healthcare professional? So when I was in high school, um, I got really, really sick with mono and uh, my body just never recovered after that. Although I know that I had EDS all my life. Um, I was always breaking bones and really, really flexible. Um, And so I was really fortunate that I was able to get that diagnosis like fairly quickly compared to I know a lot of people. And then in 2017, when I moved to Denver, I just knew that something still wasn't right. I knew I shouldn't have this many symptoms with EDS. And um, I was lucky lucky to find a really good rheumatologist who who ran tests, more specific tests that had never been done before. And um, that got me the RA and lupus diagnoses. So what were some of the specific symptoms that you experienced for each of those diagnoses? I know that they're all somehow related, but they can all kind of come in different ways, shapes and forms in your body. There is a lot of overlap, so it can be really hard to say which symptom comes from which, but really bad joint and muscle pain um, where like nothing relieves it, chronic fatigue, um, a butterfly rash, rashes all over my body, sensitivity to the sun, um, and, and those general symptoms like that. And Alexa, when you knew that Jacqueline was experiencing all of this, what were you feeling like as a sister i have an older sister um, and i just feel like any sort of sibling in the house what did you feel you know jacqueline's life was going to change yeah when she first got sick i was actually in college in massachusetts like so three thousand miles away kind of separated from it all just being a typical college kid busy doing my own thing for a while we were unable to get a diagnosis um and she had several like gi symptoms and unable to keep food down water down And my mom would call me crying because she was just unable to figure out what was going on with her. Um, And that was stressful, but I didn't really understand. And then I went on to law school in Washington, D.C., and I was still 3,000 miles away. I didn't see my family too, too often because it was hard to get home. But I didn't really understand what she was going through or her symptoms until we moved in together in Denver um, five years ago. It's hard to watch. I mean, she's the most resilient person I 
I know she doesn't complain <laughs> much, if at all. Um, but I also know like what signs to look out for when she's having a flare up. I, you know, I know how, ways to make her life easier most days. Some days I'm just her sister <laughs> uh, and a pain in the butt. But yeah, I've, you know, watching her go through her health journey has definitely changed me as a person, made me much more aware of what other people might be going through, much more compassionate and empathetic to other people. And it's interesting, a lot of people I work with, you know, they are disabled. And I think I have a very unique perspective, just because of what my sister has gone through. Even for my siblings as well, they've learned so much along the way when I was diagnosed with arthritis. So I totally understand where you're coming from. And not only did Jacqueline learn a lot, you've learned a lot too, and you were more knowledgeable in this world as well. Did you find that both of your maturity levels were higher? Not so much in high school. I I did feel like, oh, I really have this like unique set of circumstances that I have to go through that. Uh, and we went, we lived in a very small town with, I think I had like 39 people in my graduating class. So you know, I was the only one like me that I knew of. And, um, and so I did feel like I had this unique perspective and it was almost like, yes, I had to grow up really quickly and deal with these like scary healthcare professionals and undergo all these surgeries. But then at the same time, I, I, a lot of times feel like my independence was stunted at 14 when I got sick. Um, you know, like I became very reliant on my family and I, up until recently haven't felt like I was able to make that transition into adulthood and feel like an average 28 year old who is starting their own family and stuff like that. So I definitely feel like we do have a unique perspective that has helped us. And it it can be really hard to relate to people after you go through this Mm -hmm. and then you see people taking life for granted and not understanding other people's unique situations. Yeah, I think our like we're pretty emotionally intelligent because of everything you've yeah. gone through, and definitely a unique set of circumstances. Jacqueline spends most of her days at doctors and driving herself, and then because we live together, if she has a procedure, I'm driving her. And most people my age, unless like you know they have kids, they're not like taking you know people to the hospital and waiting for surgeries and waiting for procedures. It's definitely a unique perspective. It's caused us to grow up, yeah, fairly quickly, but. It's about time for me. I'm in my mid thirties, so (laughs) it's good. (laughs) I'm curious to know because it sounds very positive. You're both supporting each other, but what are some of the hurdles or problems that have arose in, you know, your relationship as sisters, if any, Jacqueline's living with this chronic illness, Alexa, you have to maybe take off time from what you do or your work. I think we're, we make a very good team. Um, We fight sometimes. We fight about the stupidest stuff. Like, you didn't take the trash out or you asked, I didn't like the tone. You asked me to take the trash out and like, <laughs> stu- like I don't remember the last time we really fought. Yeah. About but I think the, the illness. most difficult part for me at least is uh, I'm really bad at being honest with people about my symptoms. Like my least favorite question is how are you? Because I say the same thing every time I'm fine. Um, I'm never honest, so it can be hard to ask for help, but I, you know, we've lived together as adults for almost six years now. So Alexa can pick up on cues and now I'm, I'm, a, I'm getting a little more comfortable being like, okay, can you, can you take the dog out to pee? Like, I'm just really not feeling well. And I'm better at asking or just like offering. Yeah. Being, okay. do you need this? Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything I can do for you? You, she usually says no, but <laughs> So you've learned kind of how one another works and how you're able to help each other in ways that you probably had to learn when all this stuff was happening. And so you mentioned that you're from Denver or you're you're living in Denver right now. What is the healthcare system like there? I think it's pretty good. I, I'm very, very lucky that I have a good healthcare plan. I have an exception as um, a a disabled adult that I can get healthcare insurance through my dad's employer, even though I'm over 26. So that has been a huge blessing. I'm not really sure how I would navigate healthcare otherwise. We have quite a few very large hospitals 
One of them is University of Colorado, and that's a huge conglomerate that has every sort of doctor you could imagine. It's ginormous. Um, and just a bunch of other, cha- like, I don't know, syst- systemic hospitals. When you're chronically ill, though, you you learn the ERs to go to and the ones not to go to, and you learn which doctors you like. And 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 so I would say we've had a pretty good experience um, with Denver Healthcare. We grew up in Telluride, which is a very, very, very small ski resort about six and a half hours away from Denver. And so growing up there, my mom and I had to drive to Denver multiple times a month um, to get healthcare because there's no specialist. There's there's not even a hospital. There's not even a hospital <laughs> there. So any trip to the <laughs> ER, you had to drive an hour and a half. Um, so it's that's one of the main reasons that I'm in Denver is so I can be closer to healthcare. You still had to travel though. Like yes. right before the pandemic started, we were in Chicago. Jacqueline yep. had heart surgery at Northwestern. So there's still things that can't be done in Denver that we need to travel for. And it sounds like accessibility to healthcare is a big one and accessibility to access some of those healthcare systems, buildings, procedures, you know, doctors itself that caused really big barriers. Who knows what could have happened in those six hours or one hour by just like waiting. I'm curious to know, you just mentioned heart surgery. So can you can you expand about that? Yeah, so um, I was born with a congenital heart defect. My aorta, it goes towards, typically it goes towards like the left side of your chest, towards your left shoulder, but mine goes towards my right side. And one of the other arteries was wrapped around it. And so it was like clamping on it and I had an aneurysm in it. And eventually it would burst and rupture and I would have an aortic aneurysm. But for some reason we caught it at 25. I had no idea I was born with this and it was an incidental finding. And um, so I had a thoracotomy in Chicago in January of 2020. And that was that was one of the biggest surgeries I've ever had. I was really scared. There's really only one person who does this surgery on adults because it is it is so rare. It's usually caught now as babies are born. So they'll just fix it as a really, really tiny infant. And so, yeah, I mean, I still have the aortic defect. There's no way to move my aorta, but I should be good to go for for the rest of my life. That's really great to hear. And that does sound very scary. So I I totally understand that it was probably a very scary moment for you, especially because you've been through so many different diagnoses. You're still living with those. And on top of that, there are other things that arise in your healthcare journey. What medications have you been on and what do you currently take? How has your disease either gotten better or worse? So um, my dysautonomia which was diagnosed also when I was in early high school, has been fairly stable. Um, I've been on the same two medications for my POTS for for 15 years, um, which is mitogen and Toprol. And I I have a port, and so I do saline infusions um, very frequently. I'm also on IVIG for um, a common variable immunodeficiency and as far as my rheumatic diseases, I have yet to find something that works for me. I've tried Benlista, Orencia, methotrexate, steroids. I'm allergic to Plaquenil and Gabapentin. And so I haven't been able to find anything to control the pain. So right now I'm I'm just doing pain management until, until we find something. That's insane. And you're 28 years old, right? So it's been a long time. Have you had any joint damage or anything like that how are you feeling i had a jaw joint replacement when i was 21 that came on pretty quickly i was experiencing some tmj issues for a couple years not really sure what caused it or what started until they finally like took a really good look and realized that i had lost about 30 percent of my bone within one year and so at 21 i underwent the jaw joint replacement surgery and had my jaw wired shut. And then on top of that, I've just had, I've had over 40 surgeries and I would say the majority of them are on joints to, you know, replace tendons, tighten things up and, and trying to, you know, treat my chronic pain. How are you so positive while dealing with all this? And maybe there are ups and downs, obviously as a human, it's so normal to 
have your highs and lows, but how do you maintain such a positive attitude towards life? I'm not, not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I neither think, am I. <laughs> I I think it's in my nature and I'm really fortunate that I that I feel like my mental health is in a really good place. I think this is kind of just like the way I was born. Um, I've never really been a, a complainer or have made my life revolve around something negative. Um, I really take pride in enjoying the little things, making sure that anytime there is a little thing that makes me happy, I like soak it in. And I, I have the best support system. My friends and family are really, really, really helpful and understanding and empathetic. Alexa, I'm curious when Jacqueline is going through a flare up, how do you help her? Can you give me a couple examples of what you do to kind of help maybe around the house or help her feel better? Jacqueline got a feeding tube last year, about a year and a half ago. Um, but prior to that, I would cook mm-hmm. dinner. Like I would be the one to, you know, if I'm making dinner. I would make her dinner too. Um, and that was a big way I contributed just so she didn't have to worry about that. Now I don't have to worry about that. So um, food, making dinners off the table, but I will sometimes be like, do you, I'll be out. Do you want a coffee? Do you want me to bring you back something? Um, taking the dog out when, whenever I can, um, when she's, you know, away at IVIG all day, I'm in charge of the dog and um, she's very easy. So it's not really a big ask. And I, she, she's like, Yeah. I love her. Um, and just trying to be more gentle, I think, and just say like, well, if you need anything, let me know. Um, that's, you know, Jacqueline doesn't really complain and ask for much help, but I just want her to know that I'm there for her if she needs anything. We have gotten into this groove where, where she can sense what I need and, and I am comfortable asking her for help. So we really compliment each other. You know, if, if we're expecting guests and we have to clean the house, you know, she'll do the vacuuming and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll clean the the little bathroom and, and that'll be enough for me. Um, so, so she really does. She's aware of, of my limitations. Yeah. It sounds like she's trying to accommodate you and you're still able to contribute to what needs to be done. It's just that sometimes it might take you more time or you need to find things that don't trigger your conditions and it sounds like you're doing it pretty well too which is great so Jacqueline you were chronically ill at the age of 14 how did you balance academic social life and your chronic illness so it seemed like my high school had never really dealt with someone who needed any accommodations and so it was a very new learning experience for the both of us and I was really fortunate to have people advocate on my behalf um, who work, who are administrators on the, at the school. So when I was a junior, my health really took a turn second semester junior year. And so I didn't really go to school my junior year. I did some classes online. I, I went in when I could, um, but it just school at that point just like wasn't really a priority, which was a huge change because I was like a very academic student. I wanted all A's. I wanted to get into a really good college. And then senior year, we worked out a plan to just do half days. And so I would leave every day at 12 and I would go home and sleep. I was told by, you know, administrators of my school, some of them were like, you can't have a social life if you're not coming to school. But other ones were like, you need a social life. If you're not going to school, you we're not going to fault you for that. So I was involved in the school plays. Um, I would hang out with my friends because I thought it was extremely important to keep that those relationships going and have some normalcy in my life. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of the things that you said actually really like resonate with me. So I was diagnosed with the JIA at the age of 13. So it was definitely a challenge to kind of explain to accommodation services like what my own condition was, but also I don't think they had anyone in that school that had arthritis in particular. So I think it's always like case by case, they have to figure out how to accommodate. What were some of the accommodations that you had to ask for during high school versus college? And yeah. In high school, I would say it was mostly 
being able to not be there, um, depending on my symptoms and and asking my teachers to understand that I could be okay one day and the next day I might not show up. And I, I always say, like, I don't even think besides my first semester of high school that I really ever took a final. <laughs> it just always was like, okay, you like you don't have to do it, um, which yeah, that's just the school we went to. Yeah, the, the school we were at, it's very... It's a public school, but it's very laid back, very laid back. Like we, we call the teachers by their last names, but like no Mr. or Mrs. Just like their last name. So if I was like, hey, child. Yeah. Like that's how and everything's like very lackadaisical. Um, it's like a very it's a very unique yes. environment to be in. It really produces a lot of interesting students. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was mostly just like excused absences. Um extra time if I needed to, but it wasn't until I went to college where I really had to like figure out what works for me. And so I was able to get extended time on tests or have to, or I was able to take tests in rooms with different lighting. I did live alone for most of my college experience there in an on-campus apartment by myself or a dorm by myself, which was really, really helpful. Um, And I also got this like really cool gadget to record notes and lectures. So it was it was a lot of trial and error to find out what worked for me. Also, I was that type of student as well, just like you, Jacqueline, who cared about the marks that I got and the fact that I wasn't able to handwrite and do the things that I wanted to do in school and learn. That was really, really hard for me. High school accommodations were also a struggle for me as well. I think in university, I've gotten better to advocate for myself and know what works well for me. So I'm wondering if that also kind of happened with you. Were you able to now articulate more of what you needed? Were there just more options in university for accommodations? How did that work? I'm like not the best at advocating for myself. Um, I get really, really choked up. I get really anxious whenever I have to like tell someone about my accommodation. I spoke at an event at University of Colorado last week and I, I asked them, everyone else was going who was presenting was going to be standing I said mm-hmm. i require um a seat to to be in i cannot stand for more than 10 minutes and i would just be more comfortable and they were absolutely accommodating and really helpful and so that was a really good like <laughs> foot in the door to advocating for myself but it can be really hard i agree with that especially for me like over the years i think i've learned how to become more confident and talk about it also because I just had the worst experiences in high school and accommodations and now if someone in university says something I don't think I can kind of handle the fact that people are not willing to accommodate at this point so I'm just I think I've just like learned that like there's so much more that I can do um, to make sure that I get what I need and it's so nice to hear that you're starting to you know advocate for what you need and even though you're saying that it's been really hard for you that step that you just took to ask for that chair to make sure that you were comfortable is is really good because it, it it'll help you in the long run. And Alexa, have you ever needed to advocate for Jacqueline? Yeah, a lot. Um, I'm definitely I was born an advocate, and I'm incredibly outspoken about everything. I mean, I think that's probably why I became a lawyer and advocate for my clients. But I'm never afraid to tell somebody like, th- no, like this is how it's going to be. I mean, it started out when if we would ever park in the disabled parking, you know, Jacqueline does not look disabled. So people would make comments and I'd usually yell at them and tell them to mind their own business. And they have no idea. Our dad also has rheumatoid arthritis. And while now as he gets older, I think it's more obvious. There was a period of time where he was doing really well. And so you wouldn't be able to tell either. And people would say stuff to him too. And then I would start yelling at them. I remember, you know, when Jacqueline had heart surgery, the nurse wanted to just give her Tylenol. Jacqueline said she was in a ton of pain. And she said, oh, maybe you... I had literally opened my eyes from being extubated and was like, "Ah." And the nurse was like, I'm going to give her some Tylenol. And I said, no, you're not going to give her Tylenol. Like this is, she just had heart surgery. This is insane. You're going to give her something else. That's going to help her. Tylenol is not going to do anything for her, especially because she does manage her pain on a daily basis. So Tylenol is probably like, I don't know, candy. Yeah. (laughs) And the nurse listened, anything like that. And then also when, you know, she asked for the chair when we spoke, I also 
asked for a chair because I don't want to make it seem yeah. different. And I, there was one point where you were like, should I just stand? Should we just stand? And I said, no, you're going to get super shaky and weird. And we're already speaking in front of a large crowd that we don't really do. Like we're going to sit and it's fine. Yeah. I believe in like, we are who we are and never apologize for that. So whatever for all, to all the haters and whatever. <laughs> That's so nice of you to make her not feel like, you know, she's the only one who's sitting down. I've had some instances as well where even on the subway, for example, here, a lot of the seats are taken up and I'm like, okay, should I just stand? And in my head, I have to mentally be like, okay, no, like I need to sit. So sometimes as someone that is chronically ill, we don't want to admit that we might need those accommodations. We also don't want to feel different or isolated. And it's definitely a, a hard decision to make, but having you by... Jacqueline's side, like, I feel like it's made her also feel more comfortable to ask for her needs. Yeah, we were also the only ones masked, too. So I was like, we're already different. We're already the only people (laughs) wearing masks inside. So let's just sit and do what's most comfortable for you. We already are sticking out. Yes. So (laughs) yeah, I've definitely learned how to speak up because of Alexa. Um, I I usually always think of what I want to What I should have said after the encounter happens, like if someone does threaten to call the police when I use a disabled parking spot with my placard and I'm like, oh, I should have said this, this and this. But I usually am able to get something out to defend myself. (laughs) And has that happened to you? Multiple Mm -hmm. times. Oh, my God. So someone has actually threatened to call the police? Someone did once. um, And... It was, that was when I was in high school and it was like the most uncomfortable experience. I was like a cop, power, the authority. I was really freaked out. I definitely didn't say anything except that it's, it's fine. I, I, you know, I, I earned, I earned it. Um, But people have, you know, threatened, I don't know if all cities have this, but there are programs in cities where citizens can ticket other people. Um, you like just like become a volunteer and you can like give a ticket for really? people who are yeah, for people who are, that you see are abusing the system. And I had someone threaten me. And it's just really unfortunate. <laughs> I've seen it happen to other people too. I was in uh Newport, California one once at a at the mall and saw some woman harassing this younger guy for parking in the disabled parking, and I started screaming at her. <laughs> Yeah, I always think like if there's a placard, right. they're they're using it correctly. Like I don't really know how many people are using like their grandmother's right disabled parking placard. Um yeah. I see it if there's no placard or plate. Yeah. So Alexa, you mentioned that your dad has rheumatoid arthritis. Jacqueline, I'm wondering if that actually helped you in terms of how to cope with your pain and based on his experiences, were you able to learn something and be able to use his experience to help you out? Yeah, he was diagnosed when we were young. I was about eight and it happened extremely suddenly. Um, he woke up one day and couldn't couldn't walk. And it took him a while to get a diagnosis because he has seronegative um, rheumatoid arthritis. So I, I was fortunate that I knew of the world of chronic illness. Um, I didn't know it, of it for people my age when I was diagnosed, but I knew it existed. I was compassionate towards people's limitations. And I think we relate a lot. (laughs) Um, We both understand that like the pain is constant. The pain never goes away. It doesn't really help to say like, I hope you feel better soon. So, you know, we, we have a really good relationship and we're able to be open about our symptoms and, and really just be there to support each other. So I kind of wanted to move on to some of the initiatives that you've started. You mentioned a little bit about a talk that you did recently as well. Was that related to some of the work that you do together? So as Jacqueline mentioned in the very beginning, we just launched a dating app that is free for the disabled and chronically ill communities. And as a startup, we were chosen to speak at a... They call it a startup variety yeah. show. It was four different startups from Colorado that were chosen to speak at the law school at University of Colorado. And that was our first in-person event Um, And it was great. And it was really, really fun. So that's what we did last week. We do other podcasts, a lot of press, but basically our day to day now is working on the dating app and getting everyone to find out about it. 
That's so great to hear. So I guess we could go back a little bit. Can you, Jacqueline, talk a little bit about your own personal dating experiences while having a chronic illness? Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> um, I, I never realized how ableist society is until I started dating after college. I'd never really struggled with dating in high school and, and college. I was fortunate to have like a very serious boyfriend in high school who supported me through my chronic illnesses. But after college, I was just like, I felt like I was being thrown into the wolves with, with this dating world. And living in Colorado, people are asking for active, active people, people to be their adventure buddy, to go rock climbing after work, to ski every weekend. And anytime I saw that on a profile, I was like, nope, nope, they won't like me. And so I would gravitate towards people who didn't necessarily have that, who I thought I would have a better chance with. And anytime I mentioned my chronic illness or disabilities, I was met with rejection. They would either tell me like I was a burden, they didn't really want that stress in their life, or they would be really, really offensive and tell me that if I ever had children, it would be very selfish to reproduce my my genes and my genetics details. And that when I, if I said, maybe like I'd want to adopt, they'd be like, good luck with that. No one will want to do that with you. <laughs> Um, so it was really hard. I, I spent years looking for dating apps for the disabled and chronically ill communities because I just was like, there's got to be someone out there like me who has a similar perspective on life. And like, where are they? And I could never find anything legitimate. There was one dating site that I downloaded and created my profile and I immediately deleted it just because it was full of spam and bots accounts. So we really wanted to create this app as like a legitimate, inclusive space where people like me and you can just go on and and not be afraid to be judged based on our illnesses and something that we can't control. And Alexa, what were you kind of thinking when you were maybe seeing Jacqueline or hearing her talk about these experiences? Yeah, I mean, it would drive me crazy. She's so beautiful, smart, kind, has so much to offer. And these guys were idiots and you know i notice it too like there will be profiles on the mainstream apps that say looking for somebody who's active and healthy and i'm like what does that even mean i understand you know for example i probably wouldn't date somebody who smokes cigarettes okay that fair like you want i want someone who does care about their health but jacqueline cares about her health and the fact that she is not like healthy in the way yeah. these people look at it that's out of her control doesn't mean she doesn't care about it and you know I'm active I love to hike I like to ski I run but I'm not like obnoxious about it and these guys are so uh, there's a lot I mean there's a lot of things on the dating apps dating apps are very strange looking for someone to tra who can spontaneously travel I'm like well what does that mean like I have a job <laughs> I can't just pick up and go to Mexico on a Wednesday my boss would not like that I don't know if I would have noticed the ableism on the dating apps if it wasn't for Jacqueline you know I'd like to think I would but I don't really know but I definitely saw it too on the profiles and then I mean it always made me so mad that these guys would reject her but then I also say good riddance right because we don't want them. Health is ever evolving. I'm able-bodied and non-disabled right now. That doesn't mean that I will be in a month from now and a year from now. My, my situation could be different. And you really want someone who's in it for the long haul who will support you in sickness and in health. So I would always say good riddance. But then it became like a pattern where it's like, well, am I ever going to find somebody mm -hmm. who accepts me? Sure, we can write those individual experiences off. But at a certain point, Jacqueline wants to get married. And then she finally made the decision to get her feeding tube. That's when I sort of panicked because she couldn't do the active first date things, hiking, biking, whatever. Um, so she'd go out to dinner or lunch, and that was no longer an option with a feeding tube. She doesn't eat three meals a day. And I was like, what are these guys going to say? They're not even going to be able to understand it. It was something that even, you know, I had to really wrap my head around and it was a big adjustment for our family and for Jacqueline. So if it's a big adjustment for us, what is it going to be like to these guys who don't really have a lot of empathy? Uh, and that's when the idea for datability was born. That's a very inspiring story, but also you have been through so much that makes it a 
a good story, but also an awful story, because why are people like this in the world? But that kind of led you to do what you are doing today. And you've created this app called Dateability, and it's supposed to help those who live with the the chronic illnesses and disabilities to, you know, find people that will treat them for who they are. So I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about what the app is, what are the features on the app and what your personal experience with the app is. So we launched in October and it's available for, to download on iOS and Android and you can use it on the web app. So like people who, who have accessibility needs and don't use smartphones or just would prefer to use a computer, you can access it at databilityapp.com. What makes Datability different besides our mission is that we do have a section on the profile called Datability Deets and it's a list, a long list of broad terms that people can choose from like chronic illness, wheelchair user, mobility aid. And so there's no pressure to reveal your diagnoses. Of course, if someone wants to, they can type that in or put that in their bio. But we just want to neutralize disability and chronic illness and destigmatize it um, and really present it as a thing as like, this is who I am. It's not going anywhere. It is what it is. And I'm and I'm done being ashamed of it. And so that's that's been a really great part of the profile. And the app works very similar to all the dating apps. You can swipe or press the X or heart button. You can message. And, you know, we're an ever growing community. So right now people can log on and see everyone on the app doesn't doesn't filter by location until we gain a really large user base because we want to give the users the best experience possible. But yeah, it's it's been a, re- a real journey and learning experience. Yeah. I mean, tech is always changing. One day, everything will be operating fine. The next there's a bug. You know, we want people to reach out to us when there's something that's not working correctly, but often we don't find out about it until somebody leaves us a review or something. And, and it's, that is something the customer service side, it's so frustrating, but it's something that we're learning also. Um, And we have a lot of plans for expansion. So how would you say this app is inclusive? So can people without disabilities actually access this app or do you have to be disabled? It's inclusive. And we were toying around with that idea when we initially came up with it. But to be an all-inclusive app, we have to include everyone. And there are people like my sister or one of my friends who are comfortable with disability and chronic illness and don't see that as a disadvantage to someone's relationship. And, you know, we really value diversity. So it's all types of chronic illnesses or disabilities, psychiatric, intellectual, uh, physical disabilities, because we we don't believe that just because I have lupus, I need to date someone else who has lupus. Um, but, you know, maybe I would find someone with Crohn's who would, who's a really good match for me. Um, so we're definitely just an all-inclusive app. And so how has, you know, when you started the app to now, how has it grown? We have not had a day since launching where someone hasn't signed up. We have over 2,000 users. Of course, we need that number to grow. But for being in existence for three months, we're pretty happy. We have yet to pay for marketing. So it's been strongly pressed word of mouth and social media, but we are venturing into really spreading the word this year. Sometime in the next couple months, we will be adding a friendship logic. So we believe that platonic relationships are just as important as romantic relationships. And, you know, from Jacqueline's experiences and speaking to other people with disabilities and chronic illness, they say that it's just as hard to find platonic friends as it is to find a romantic partner. And so we think it's really important to give this community that space to find all kinds of relationships and companionship and so we'll be um, introducing that as well that's a really really great feature to have especially because of people you know when you are diagnosed or going through this journey you do feel alone and sometimes maybe you're not interested in dating but you just need friends or someone to talk to that has somewhat similar lived experiences as you and so i think that feature will definitely be beneficial to a lot of people in the community have either one of you actually used this app for your own personal you know, dating life or experiences, or is it just something that you want to give back to the community? I'm on it. Um, although running a startup has proven to be extremely time consuming. So I, I don't use it, uh, you know, recreationally and, and have time to enjoy it. I'm on it like to test. And I mean, I, I am 
on it, you know, casually. And if I see someone I'm interested in, I'll send them a like. But yeah, I mean, I really hope that this place becomes the space where I can find my partner because ultimately I did make it with me in mind. And I would be on it, but I at this point I'm working two full time jobs essentially. So I was yes. like, there's absolutely I have no space. I barely have time to see my friends. So there's no room for dating right now. Um, so <laughs> I'm taking a step back from that. I yeah. Yeah, especially like, you know, managing the app and a lot of apps do have bugs, which you mentioned. And so like trying to fix that, and especially if you're not getting the comments or the feedback as soon as possible, and you have to like wait for a review to come out, that must be such a challenge to go and like, fix, fix the things that are happening as soon as possible. Do you have a team behind this? Or is it just both of you? We are not tech people at all, especially me. We got really lucky and found a team out in Boulder, which is 30 minutes from Denver, that does all of the coding and engineering for us. So, you know, the second we see something wrong, we message them and yeah. tell them, and then they'll fix it. Although it, it's, you know, important to note that things can take weeks to fix. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a real bummer. It's never easy. And we are the only ones working for Datability. So we do deal with the marketing, the customer service, the press. So it's it's us if someone's emailing us or messaging us. But, you know, we're very receptive to feedback. And we mm-hmm. know that we want this app to be the app that the community deserves. So we're, we're making any changes. We're not, we don't, we're not just like releasing it and, and dipping out. We're really working every day to improve it. Yeah. And so how can someone who gets on this app customize their profile? Um, are there any filters that they can use when they want to, for example, look for a partner? How, how does that work? Yeah, so we are inclusive of all disabilities, gender, races, everything. And so when you are making your profile, you can upload your pictures, put your location, put your age, put your gender. Yeah. Uh, gender, you know, like your sexual orientation, what you're interested in. Um, and what you're interested in, your age range that you're interested in. Eventually, we will be able to filter out by location. But right now, we just want everyone to see everyone else, which some people like, some people don't like. But we think logging on and seeing two other people within your lo- radius is not a great user experience. And I also think that with this day in this day and age with technology, people are much more open to long distance relationships or long distance companionship because there is FaceTime and all these different, you know, mechanisms. Um, so for now the location one cannot filter by location, but they can filter by age and gender. And so yeah, it's pretty it's as it's as custom as most dating yeah. apps. Are. Right now you, you can't cuss you can't filter based on like the datability deet section. So you right. can't filter based on like wheelchair user or chronic illness. Um, it's an idea that you know, we might be considering, but I, I also think that it's it, it's a little short sighted um, to have to be filtering by those attributes. What are your future plans for datability? What has been your greatest accomplishment so far? We have a lot of plans. You know, we're in the phase where we're securing investors and we really want to make this app huge. Um, So like Alexa mentioned, adding the friendship logic, we're also adding like profile verification, similar to the other apps that you can have a badge if your pictures match the ones you submit. Um, And, you know, our biggest accomplishment, we really just love the positive feedback. Like, you know, we have been in the Washington Post and NPR and those have been so, so great. But it is the user feedback that makes us like really smile and and be so happy and realize that this is all worth it because it's really really difficult but when someone says like I've been looking for something like this for so many years and I signed up and I'm just so excited to date without judgment it it's just Mm -hmm. it touches us yeah I think the whole experience itself and how rewarding it is to get the feedback and to see how much people enjoy the work that you're doing as much as you love doing it. I think it it, it goes really far. And I wanted to end off the podcast episode with an advice segment. So Jacqueline, what advice would you give to someone living with a chronic illness who is trying to navigate the dating world? I would say trust your gut. If you don't feel like you should disclose your disability, you don't have to. Um, I really struggled with timing 
and figuring out if I didn't tell someone, was I hiding it? Um, was I lying to them? Or if I told someone, am I telling someone this deep information way too early? So trust your gut. And, you know, it's it's not the worst thing in the world to be rejected. I think that rejection is redirection and it really weeds out the ablest people and the people who, you know, won't support you. Alexa, what would you say to someone who wants to give support to a close one that lives with a rheumatic disease, but is struggling because they don't really know how to go about it? Yeah, I think just listening is probably the most important and hearing and then soaking in what they're saying. If they say, I don't want to talk about it right now. Okay, well, let me know if you ever want to talk about it. I am here to listen, no judgment. I think listening is pro- and being receptive is probably the best thing that one can do for uh, someone who is chronically ill. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Alexa, for joining me today on this week's episode. We talked about Jacqueline's diagnoses and the symptoms that she experienced before getting diagnosed, the medications that she's tried. And we looked into the healthcare system in Denver and how it's it's different from you know a lot of the other states and cities out there. We dived into Jacqueline's school life and how she dealt with her chronic condition while balancing her social life. We moved on to talking about dateability and after what Jacqueline and Alexa founded for people with disabilities. And we discussed the inspiration behind it all, including the features of the app and how both the sisters seek to grow this platform. So make sure to check out the dating app. I will link all the details down below in the description. Like, comment, subscribe, share this episode, stream it on other platforms, and I'll see everyone in two weeks on Take a Pain Check. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Alexa. Bye. Thank you.